move to something completely different now, right? Stratosphere. Advances your slides also. Okay. This advances advances your slides. Yeah. Let's put it in my. There we go. All right. Um, before I open this up, um, I just wanted to point out to people that uh, at the end, I, I included more slides than I know I'm gonna get through, and I didn't do that because I was trying to pack things in. I did that because uh, there were some things that I won't touch on, but I thought were important for you guys to all know about. Um, and what I did was at the end of my talk, I added all of the references, so if you see them, you can, because I, I think these are being made, the slides are made public available, yeah. So then you can go and find the relevant papers and go to the direct sources, so just be aware of that. All right, so show of hands, how, how many people have worked on the stratosphere or have even read about stratosphere? Okay, like three, right? Okay, so uh, I work at this place called the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And uh, when I first came there as a postdoc, um, I took a lot of abuse, ongoing. Uh, I, I, I endure a lot of jokes about, uh, the, these are names for the stratosphere, uh, the so what sphere, uh, the ignorosphere, uh, the sponge layer, you know, that it's, it's, a, it's the rigid lid for Matsuno modes. Uh, I think largely just uh, telling me that, that my work is uh, irrelevant. Uh, but that, that turns out to not be the case. So why should you care about the stratosphere? Um, well, this is just one example. So this is uh, by a paper by Hansen that just came out recently. And they're exploiting what's called a nudging experiment. And essentially what you do is you take um, you know, like the European Center climate model, or uh, S2S model, and you nudge particular portions of, this, of the atmosphere to perfect conditions. So it's like saying, uh, if we had a perfect tropics or a perfect stratosphere, what would the effect be on our, on our predictability? And I show three panels here. Uh, the black line is the interim, and the other is forecast model for, you know, 30 plus some years of data. And this is the NAO index for two types of nudging experiments. One is uh, where they've taken observed SSTs and nudged tropics. So that's essentially like, I don't know, 15 south to 15 north. And you take winds, temperature, all those sorts of things. And you say, OK, we got that perfect. Uh, what's what's going to be the extratropical response? And the other is a, a nudged stratosphere. So they pick some layer above which the model is getting perfect stratospheric variability. And what you'll see here is this is the correlation uh, between the NAO for when you get perfect tropics. The correlation is significant and it's 0.51. However, if you get perfect stratosphere, you get a correlation of 0.72. So the point being there, uh, that despite being a sponge layer, uh, you can get, you know, harness a lot of predictability out of knowing things out of, out of the stratosphere. So uh, 
I sort of assumed that no one had, uh, that most people don't know a lot about the stratosphere. So um, I'm giving a lecture on, on Wednesday that's going to really go through the particulars of teleconnections and strat trope coupling. But today, I wanted to just kind of go through some basic dynamics of the stratosphere and what's called a sudden warming, sudden stratospheric warming, because that's probably uh, the most uh, impactful type of event uh, whereby you get communication between the stratosphere and the troposphere and enhanced predictability. And I'm going to go through uh, just kind of some basics of the triggering mechanisms for how these happen and, and some basic kind of deterministic pr uh, predictability. Because when you have one of these warmings, you get maybe uh, 60 days of enhanced predictability. Um, so in my second talk, I'll talk about uh, predictability of sudden warmings in a more probabilistic seasonal sense. Uh, but today, when I go over the basic dynamics of warmings, I'm going to talk uh, at the end. I'll briefly touch a bit on, on the deterministic predictability. All right, so the stratosphere, in some sense, is maybe a little bit more simple of a, uh, you know, I, I tease the people that I work with that uh, make fun of me that the, the, the troposphere is kind of like this noisemaker and you can't figure out what's going on. Uh, in the stratosphere, we have, I, I can distill it down to, in some sense, uh, these two pictures. So essentially, the interesting things that go on in the stratosphere is during the winter. We have what's called the charney drazen condition, which essentially says if there's easterlies, planetary waves can't propagate up into the stratosphere from the troposphere. But in the winter, we have westerlies, uh, and the window opens up, and waves are allowed to propagate up into the stratosphere. So in the absence of those waves, uh, on the left panel here is what a temperature uh, in January might look like for what's called radiative convective equilibrium. So this is just a temperature that would occur if we didn't have any waves. And essentially, you get a very cold pole and you know, warm, more warm over, uh, over the tropics. Uh, but in reality, this is what the actual temperature structure looks like. This is just from error interim. And really what you see is, is that actually over, uh, over the equator, things are colder than they would be in uh, radiative convective equilibrium uh, over the equator and warmer uh, over the poles. And this is essentially due to the effects of, of waves propagating up, breaking, and driving uh, this, this equator to pole overturning circulation, uh, which causes adiabatic cooling over the equator and adiabatic warming uh, over the poles. So, um, the, 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 two, the balance essentially that we have here in the stratosphere is uh, the, the atmosphere trying to relax to this very cold pole uh, that sets up this circumpolar vortex. And then we have waves propagating up from the troposphere and breaking in the stratosphere uh, and warming the stratosphere uh, and, and slowing down that circumpolar vortex. So what does that look like? So what I've done here is I've taken a video, and this is potential vorticity on um, an isentrope uh, isentropic surface maybe in the mid-stratosphere. And this is what, uh, in, as the fall progresses from, say, October to December, this is what um, the spin-up of the, the vortex looks like. And where the warm colors are is, uh, you can just think of it as, as warmer, and where, where it's blue, it's cold. And the black line kind of gives you an idea of where the edge of the, the polar vortex is in the stratosphere. And kind of one of the things that you can notice right away is, um, there's a lot of deformity to, to, to the vortex, and that's the effect of these Rossby waves that are propagating up from the, strat or from the troposphere and breaking on the periphery of the vortex. So these are, these are the waves that cause, uh, kind of slow, the, slow and disrupt the vortex and cause it to not be quite as cold and strong as it would be uh, in the absence of those waves. Those waves turn out to be uh, the, the portion of the dynamic that causes sudden stratospheric warmings are a part of the evolution of the sudden warming. And that is uh, really the, the, this is the system that we want to understand if we want to understand predictability in terms of the stratosphere. Very pretty, right? You just like stare at this for like hours. It's like looking at the cream in your coffee or something like that that my wife teases me about. All right. So I should point out that when I talk about the, the polar vortex, I'm talking about the stratospheric portion. Um, and Darren Waugh kind of made this clear because, you know, in, at least in the U.S., that the polar vortex has been talked about a lot in the news. And the point they were trying to make is that there's, there's two really circumpolar vorte vortices, uh, one in the troposphere and one in the stratosphere. And you can kind of see what these two look like. And the way that I kind of schematically think about this in my head is, is you can kind of think about these, 
two vortices, they're somewhat in independent, but maybe they're, they're coupled by like some sort of string and they, as they both wobble um, around, they, they kind of interact with one, or, one another in sort of a loose manner. So if we perturb one, uh, it's gonna do something to, to the other, uh, though the character of that perturbation is an area of ongoing uh, research and debate. Uh, but just know that when I'm talking about the polar vortex today, I'm largely talking about the stratospheric one and its impact of perturbations to that on the tropospheric vortex. So as I mentioned, the most uh, impactful types of events in the stratosphere are what are called sudden stratospheric warmings. And when one of these events happens, um, essentially it's defined by the following criteria. Uh, if we take a latitude circle where I've drawn the, the red line um, around 60 degrees north at about 30 kilometers in height, what we need to see is the pole to equator temperature gradient switch uh, from westerlies to easterlies. And uh, we, or <laughs> I'm sorry, the zonal wind needs to, to switch from uh, westerlies to easterlies. And the pole to, to equator temperature gradient needs to reverse. Um, and I'll show exactly what that means. That it's just so you're getting an idea of what, how big of an event this is, we're talking about over the course of a week, you're talking about the, the whole column inside uh, this circle uh, flipping by like say 40 degrees Kelvin. So we're talking about a huge dy dynamical disruption uh, to the stratosphere. And they come in two flavors. Uh, on the left here, I've showed kind of what a typical vortex looks like. Uh, it's largely centered over the pole, it's pretty circular. And then on the left, the center and the right are two examples of what a sudden warming looked like. And we, we call them two kinds. One is a displacement, and that's because uh, we essentially just take vortex and we just push it off the pole, okay? And the reason, uh, you know, you gotta think when you take a, a zonal average, you're, you're sampling, it's not that, that the vortex is completely ob obliterated necessarily, but when you take that zonal average around that circle, uh, the wind is easterly in that averaged sense. It's not that the vortex itself has become easterly. Uh, the other kind of sudden warming is what's called a split. And during one of those events, which one could argue are a bit more violent, uh, is the, the vortex gets split into two pieces uh, and then they start counter rotating. So, because I like seeing these things, I think it's good to see what they look like visually. This is a, uh, a PV map of a displacement event, and essentially you can see it just gets, you see these waves breaking on the periphery of the vortex, and then you see uh, the vortex getting pushed off the pole, um, and that's, that's essentially, you know, uh, a huge disruption over in the extratropics throughout the column in the stratosphere. The other type of event, as I said, is the split, and this is in 2009. Um, and for this one, we're gonna see the vortex kind of get squeezed into a kind of a peanut shape and then be ripped apart and essentially completely obliterated. So uh, you can imagine that dynamically, the difference between having this beautiful uh, vortex centered over the pole uh, like this and then having absolutely nothing uh, throughout the whole column in the stratosphere, you can imagine that that has a, is, is somehow gonna translate some sort of large impact to the troposphere. So just so everyone knows, there's also some, you know, those were on horizontal surfaces. There's vertical structure to these uh, types of events and they are particularly dependent on whether it's displacement or whether it's a split. Uh, for displacement, um, these on the right here, you see these are, the colors are two different levels. And what you see is, is when, when that vortex gets pushed off the pole, that happens more strongly at upper levels than it down, does at, at, at lower levels. So it's really got like a first bear clinic vertical structure. Splits on the other hand, when the vortex rips apart like that and starts counter rotating around itself, uh, those structures, those two uh, daughter vortices have largely bare tropic structure. So they, that, that, what happens at, at one level is happening through the whole depth of, of the atmosphere. So just to kind of summarize, there's, there's two types of warmings. There's the displacement, that's pushing it off the pole, and the split where you rip it apart. 
they have a distinct vertical structure, and from a kind of a predictive standpoint, uh, one of the conditions, you know, we, we sort of wouldn't want to know, well, how predictable are sudden warmings? And when I say that in today's talk, I'm going to be uh, talking in the, a deterministic sense. So uh, are there conditions that enhance the wave forcing, right? So uh, this is uh, the, the, the forcing that causes one of these events. Uh, or might there be stratospheric basic states that are conducive to one of these types of events happening? So kind of the traditional theory goes back to uh, Matsuno in 1971. And the idea here is, is that all we need to do is one of two things. Essentially, you need to generate enough wave activity in the troposphere so that we have this huge wave that propagates into the stratosphere and that disrupts, disrupts the vortex. And two, there's this notion of what's called preconditioning. So might there be basic states in the stratosphere that are more receptive to huge pulses of wave activity? So how does this, how do they kind of envision this, this working? So as I mentioned before, there's a, what's the, the charney drazen condition, and it just says that there's a, a wave propagation window such that winds have to be westerly, greater than zero, but less than some critical wave speed. So essentially we have waves propagating up, um, and if that pulse is large enough, it gets into, it, it, it hits a critical line uh, in the upper stratosphere, say, and it breaks and it reverses the, the, wind, the winds from westerly to easterly. And when that happens, you're now negative, so there's no, the waves can't propagate any higher now, so your window is closed. And this just keeps happening at lower and lower levels, and the cascade moves, moves downward, right? So this is the critical layer cascade that Matsuno was getting after. So that, that critical layer wave absor absorption is nonlinear, but the propagation of those waves to that critical level are, is, is, is pretty much a quasi-linear or linear phenomenon. So then, as I mentioned, how do we trigger this critical layer cascade? And the two questions are, you know, generating enough activity or focusing that, you know, this is the preconditioning idea. So evidence that supports this anomalous wave forcing type of idea, um, this paper by Lorenzo and, and Darren uh, Lorenzo Cavani and Darren Waugh, in 2004 gets cited a lot. And you can stare at this uh, plot if you like in your free time, but I can just tell you what the message is here. They picked 100 hectopascals and, uh, for the northward heat flux. That's essentially the waves coming through the 100 hectopascal surface in the lower stratosphere. And they correlated that with the 10 hectopascal NAM. And what they found is, is that that correlation peaks for about 40 days of integrated wave flux. So the idea there was is if we have periods of anomalously high wave flux integrated over a 40-day period, that's the most strongly correlated with uh, variations in the NAM. Okay, so that's... Oh, I'm sorry. So the northern... Thank you. <laughs> the northern annual mode. So, uh, you know, depending on who you ask, uh, you know, that's the Arctic Oscillation, the, North Atlantic Oscillation. Essentially, uh, the NAM is kind of a measure of the, the strength. You can just think of it as the strength of, of the vortex, right? So, um, you know, strong, or when, when the NAM is in one phase or the other, at least in the stratosphere, you can think of uh, as a strong or weak vortex event. So the idea here being that if you have a lot of wave activity, the vortex is very weak, and vice versa. So in that traditional kind of theory, uh, preconditioning would happen in the following sense. Uh, so on this upper left panel here, I've, I've shown what kind of, say, uh, the meridional PV gradient looks like under climatological conditions. And you can think of that PV gradient as your waveguide. And I've drawn a red line here uh, showing where, where you might expect your waves to propagate given that basic state. And kind of the tendency is, is the waves propagate up and they uh, due to curvature effects, amongst other things, they propagate equatorward and they break somewhere um, not near the pole. And that's not conducive to, uh, to breaking vortex down. So the idea is, is that if you can somehow change the PV gradient and then focus the wave activity poleward, you're going to, um, for a given amount of wave flux coming up from the troposphere, uh, you're going to disrupt the vortex more strongly. And kind of the idea here is, is if you just take the absolute vorticity gradient, the way that you might accomplish this is a precursor wave that propagates up and it breaks. 
And if we look at the dashed line as an initial uh, absolute vorticity or PV gradient uh, structure, and then we add a perturbation that's wave breaking that mixes uh, low PV air poleward and high PV air uh, equatorward. <coughs> in the end, if you then calculate, recalculate what the gradient looks like, uh, the vorticity gradient, you get a sharpened edge uh, just like this. So here's kind of a weak PV gradient, and here we have a sharpened PV gradient, right? And that's so if we have a wave that comes up, breaks, it reshapes the PV gradient, and so then subsequent waves that come up now are experiencing uh, a sharper PV gradient that's helping to focus things forwards. You can see this in simple shallow water models. Essentially, if we start an upper left-hand panel, uh, with kind of uniform uh, PV field. And then we go left to right across the screen and you start driving the model and you have a wave breaking event on the periphery of the vortex. And by the time that's all said and done, we see that the PV field has been reorganized and we have this nice uh, sharp PV gradient that's uh, tight up against the pole compared to what we had at the beginning, okay? And I'll just leave this quote up here. Uh, this is from the, that, that Polbani and Wall paper, and it's just making the key point, therefore, that they were trying to make, which is that these events are driven by anomalous wave activity generated in the troposphere. So that's kind of the traditional view. So uh, that's not the end all story for how warmings are generated. So there are alternative views on this. Picking up on the resonance ideas, uh, I've given you a snapshot of the literature here. I, it, I would encourage everyone to go out and read it. I won't lie, it's thick. Um, and it's, uh, it will take some time to, it's like chewing cement or something like that. I've, trying to, I've tried to uh, condense it down to kind of its essence so you can just get a kind of a flavor for it because uh, I, I sort of feel like it's not appreciated. And one of the reasons why it's not appreciated is uh, it, it requires a non-trivial amount of mathematical sophistication. Uh, and um, sometimes that doesn't translate in those papers to physical insight for kind of the general populace like us. Uh, so hopefully you can walk away from this knowing a little something about, about these other types of ideas. Um, so there's two types of resonance. There's internal mode resonance and external mode resonance. The big thing to take away here is that there would be different notions of how the warming is triggered. In particular, in a resonant framework, you do not need an, uh, an anomalous amount of wave activity. This is a, an internal uh, nonlinear dynamic to the stratosphere, uh, tro troposphere coupled system, but you don't, you, the, the, the big story is you don't need to generate, you don't, you don't need a huge blocking event in the troposphere or something like that to drive wave activity. Likewise, preconditioning can mean something very different uh, in, in um, or at least the interpretation of what the PV gradient looks like can mean something very different. Another set of papers that I'm not gonna go over um, are essentially uh, Alan O'Neill's set of papers. And these papers are very underappreciated. They don't get cited much. His, he's got some work going back to the 80s, but I would, if anybody's interested in sudden warmings, I would really encourage you to read those papers uh, because even if it turns out that they're not right. Uh, his papers are full of wonderful physical insight, uh, and they're they're very good to read, even if uh, you don't dig deeply into the into the, the details. So I would just I, I included those series of references to be complete. So uh, these resonant ideas, while they don't need anomalous forcing, you do need some amount of forcing, right? You need a wave present there to begin with. Just want to make that clear that this isn't like a <laughs> Uh, the stratosphere does not generate this you know, wave activity initially on its own. You need some amount of wave activity coming up from the troposphere. That's certainly here, uh, key. And I'm going to also discuss, uh, discuss the notions of, of preconditioning, how they differ in these types of scenarios. So as I mentioned, there's two types of resonance. One is what's called an internal resonance. And the way to think about this is that is, is, is you somehow build a high latitude wave cavity. Okay, so this would be uh, on the right would be the North Pole, uh, and the left would be the equator. And if we get conditions right, essentially what you do is you stop the waves from being able to propagate equatorward. They have a reflecting surface or some such uh, type of uh, barrier 
uh, in the upper stratosphere, and it, essentially you can think about this as reflecting the wave back down, and if those, the upward and downward components of that wave become in phase, uh, they resonate with one another, and you get this nonlinear interaction that causes, causes a warming. So uh, there, the anomalous wave fluxes that you see in the stratosphere are a function of that resonant interaction between the upward and downward components, and not just a, a huge pulse from the troposphere. So that's internal mode resonance. External mode resonance is, is slightly different. So the way to think about this is if on the left panel we start with uh, fixed topographic for forcing that for this case I've shown a wave number two forcing, uh, we just generate a stationary Rossby wave that has a wave number two structure. Now on top of that, if we have a free barotropic mode that is a traveling wave that's traveling around the periphery of the vortex, their kind of idea is, is that uh, the PV gradient and the width speed of the vortex itself determines the phase speed of that traveling wave. So that determines how quickly the, this traveling wave is, is winging around the vortex. So you could think about it like this. Uh, if you look at the middle panel and you see this, this structure that's kind of oval shaped, you can imagine that kind of whipping around the vortex. And if we tune, uh, we change the PV gradient and the wind speed such that, that we affect the phase speed of that traveling wave to the point where in the frame of reference of that stationary forcing, you can see how we have, you know, we have plus, plus, minus, minus. If that traveling wave's wave number two pattern lines up, it becomes stationary in the frame of reference of the fixed topography. Those two things line up and it's no longer traveling. Those two waves start resonating with one another and you get an explosion that, that triggers one of these warnings. As I mentioned, uh, in essence of time, I'm not gonna go through uh, Alan O'Neill's work on vortex interactions, but it's a very cool piece of literature and I don't wanna downplay it. Uh, I just don't have time to go through today, but I, as I said, if people are interested in sun warmings, I would encourage you to read uh, some of his work. So to summarize, we have you know, two kinds of ideas, or three rather. Uh, we have kind of the traditional idea, which is anomalous forcing, and then we have the resonance ideas, uh, and then we have vortex interactions. So uh, these are all kind of theoretical notions. Uh, what uh, does the data tell us? Well, there are some things that we can look at in the data to give us a clue. So if warmings are, are triggered by anomalous forcing, then we should be able to trace large pulses of wave activity from the troposphere to the stratosphere, right? Um, and this should happen at linear group velocity timescales. You generate a wave, it propagates up to the stratosphere, and that should happen at some sort of, to the critical layer where it triggers that, that uh, downward critical layer cascade. And we should be able to see this. So what do we see? So this is for the 2009 split sudden warming. That was the second video that I showed you. And what I'm plotting here uh, is December through January. And these are the 45 to 75 degree north averaged uh, vertical wave fluxes um, in height. And what I've superimposed here, so you can think of each of these uh, shoots going up. That's, that's like a, a pulse of, of wave activity. And what I've superimposed on here but with, with the arrows are standard group velocity timescales. So if we're thinking that things are propagating up at the linear group velocity timescale, then we should get a nice strong match between uh, the slope of that arrow and the slope of those wave fluxes going into the stratosphere. And what we see for the early December, late December events is that it works really beautifully. During those early events, we see uh, wave pulse coming up from the troposphere and propagating to the upper stratosphere at what we would, at a very beautifully, to what we would expect for kind of standard group velocity time scales that are about uh, five to seven kilometers per day. However, these right to flux events, and I hope you can see uh, the contours here, these are the events that were associated with the warming. And what we see is, is if you look at the, the contours is, they don't follow the group velocity time scale at all. When something starts occurring here at, you know, 100 to 200 hectopascals, it shows up almost instantaneously at all heights. Okay, so that doesn't look like linear um, propagation of an anomalous pulse. This uh, is more 
um, when we have one of these resonant interactions, we expect uh, the wave energy to kind of explode all at once throughout the depth of the, the, the stratosphere. So this kind of gives us an idea that, that uh, maybe the traditional ideas are not, not quite right. So essentially, how could we look at, you know, I showed you before these ideas of preconditioning and of, of wave focusing. I showed you the PV gradient uh, that was very sharp. Uh, and indeed, for the 2009 warming, we did have this very sharp PV gradient. So what that means is in the traditional sense, right, is instead of waves propagating equatorward, here I've shown what's called the refractive index for, climato uh, for the DJF climatology. And the ref refractive index essentially just tells you uh, where waves are going to propagate. Um, so for, for, you know, this could be, this is that idea of, of wave focusing in the traditional sense. However, we also see, we can interpret this in terms of what it might mean for resonance. This very strong, sharp PV gradient at, it can be related to, as remember I told you about the external mode resonance, the phase speed of that traveling wave is a function of the vortex edge PV gradient. So as I change that vortex edge PV gradient, I bring that traveling wave, uh, I slow it down so it becomes stationary in, in the frame of reference of that topographic wave. And it turns out as you, uh, in the theoretical sense, as you sharpen the PV gradient, you're slowing down. It's been shown that you slow down the wave, uh, the traveling wave speed, and you bring it more uh, closely towards that resonant point. Unfortunately, when you start looking at the refractive index, I mentioned a wave cavity, and I don't know if you can see it here, but uh, this is the region of, of wave propagation, kind of like in that diagram I showed you, and this looks <laughs> very beautifully like a wave cavity, i.e. the wave would come up and reflect back down and the regions of white, it can't propagate. So when it comes up, reflected back down, it can't go equatorward and we kind of hold it in. So it also looks uh, like conditions are ripe for internal mode resonance, right? Um, when I first started looking at this, uh, I went to a gentleman named Alan Plum and I was, he's a very sharp dynamicist and I was hoping that he could look at this and uh, be like, oh no, you need to look at uh, this piece of information to help you differentiate between those two types of resonance. Um, and also you could tell me was, oh no, it looks like resonance, but I, uh, I don't have a way to tell you which one it is. So that's still an open question. However, all of these things are uh, consistent with the ideas of resonance. Okay, so that's for one event. Can we extrapolate this to um, a larger series of events? So. We're gonna do the following. We're gonna take error interim data for you know, 30 plus years, 35, 36 years. And we're gonna do two things. One is we're gonna define an anomalous wave event as the deseasonalized 10 day average vertical EP flux, which is just, that's just the amount of wave activity um, vertically propagating in the stratosphere, average between 45 and 75 north at 700 hectopascals. And that's it gives you a time series, right? So that's a time series of essentially wave generation at 700 hectopascals. It's how much uh, are we generating in the lower troposphere that's gonna then propagate into the stratosphere. And we define anomalous events by two standard deviations. We do the flip side for anomalous winds. I'm not gonna go through that, but uh, know that that result, look, you get a consistent result that I'm about to show you no matter how you look at this. Okay, so, um, I'm gonna step you from left to right, just uh, the, the picture's consistent between the top and the bottom. The top is just for uh, wave number one events and the bottom is for wave number two events. So that's essentially, not necessarily displacement, it's flipped, but more or less you can, you can think about it like that. And what, I'm, what it's showing here is the black contours are uh, the 10 hectopascal upward wave flux and the colors are the 10 day average uh, uh, zonal, not 10 hectopascal, but the zonal wind tendency for all heights. And the one thing you need to know here is that we have taken these quantities and we've divided them by their standard deviation that's level specific, okay, right? And we've done that because, uh, you know, one standard deviation of wave flux at, at, in the troposphere looks very different than one standard deviation of the wave flux in the stratosphere. So you really wanna do this level by level. In essence, what that does is where you see contours, they're significant. So this little hatch mark here is uh, we do correlations with respect to wave events that I, as I defined. So that's 700 hectopascals and these are forward and positive and negative lag. And 
essentially, uh, as I said, the, the contours are, are, are the wave flux and the, the colors are the change in the wind, right? So for all, during that time period, for all the wave number one large flux events, um, this is, you know, we, we get this structure. You see uh, wave activity and the zonal wind co-locating with one another, which is not surprising because the waves are driving the change in the wind. However, if we look, if we separate by wave events that started in the troposphere that did not produce decelerate, strong decelerations in the stratosphere, um, what you see is, is that for wave events where there was no strong deceleration in the stratosphere, um, you could, you look at this as uh, the tilt here, and essentially it's like looking at that, the, the plot I showed with the group velocity vectors. For those events, uh, those wave events that start at 700 hectopascals and propagate up, you get a nice clean linear group velocity uh, propagation time scale into the stratosphere, but they don't cause a strong uh, change in the forcing. However, if we look at the difference between uh, events that, uh, that have, uh, that do cause strong decelerations versus those that don't, the difference is, is that the wave fluxes are anomalous in the stratosphere, but not in the troposphere at all. So you'll, not only that, you'll notice that whatever happens in the lower stratosphere, it immediately happens throughout the depth of the stratosphere. And so this is offering another view that it's not just that 2009 warming that I looked at, it's essentially the bulk of all events, is that you generate some amount of wave activity and then something nonlinear like resonance happens in the stratosphere and boom, it explodes and it happens at all levels. Are the mean stage different, or why is it different? Why is it, are the waves different, or is the mean stage different? That is a open question. Um, as I showed, some of the mean state, you know, conditions, uh, you know, like for this is just for one event. You do see a strong evidence of. of uh, the mean state being different, you know, like the formation of a cavity or something like that. Um, that's an open line of research right now. Um, in fact, this paper, we just published it this year. So this is just, I guess, the, these ideas, these resonant ideas have been around for a long time, um, going back to the early 80s, but they've actually just started to be kind of brought up more recently. And we, in this paper, the whole idea was to just look at the data and see if the data supports one or the other. But as far as taking it beyond that, that's, that's an open area of research. So the one thing I would like to point out here is that that's kind of the composite view, right? So only, it's kind of takeaways from that is only 11 of the 53 wave events in the data record, two standard deviation wave events in the, in the, in the lower troposphere are associated with a wind event. If you flip the coin and you define wave events and you, um, you get a similar view. So you say, well, only 11 of the 32 strong wave events in the, in the stratosphere are preceded by, a, uh, are in the wind events in the stratosphere are preceded by a strong uh, wave event in the troposphere. And in terms of sudden warmings, it's only seven of the 28 warmings in the data record are associated with anomalous wave events. So what does that mean? That means that kind of the ag on aggregate, most sudden warmings are not caused by anomalous generation of wave activity in the troposphere. But that doesn't mean that not, not all of them are. So if you look through every event, there are certainly events where you've been able to, there's a block or something like that that generates a ton of wave activity and you can trigger a warming like that. But in general, uh, that's not the case. And that has implications for both the deterministic and probabilistic predictability on seasonal timescales, right? How are we doing on time? What are we? Yeah. How long have I been yammering? It's uh, 1.20, so I... What I time did I... Just uh, 10 minutes. Okay, yeah, no problem. Because I, I can, I mean, I, I don't know what time I started, but I can, I can... I think, I think... Uh, 10 minutes? Yeah. I can make it short. So uh, this is a paper by, uh, that just came out by a co-author of mine, and essentially this is one of these nudging experiments, and it just hits home kind of some of the topic, some of the ideas that I just put out. And essentially the idea behind uh, the paper was uh, 
can you nudge the troposphere to be identical and then run ensembles to see uh, if changes to the stratospheric basic state, like you're asking, do they, do they matter? So you nudge uh, from essentially 10 hectopascals, or I mean uh, 10 kilometers down. So the whole troposphere is identical in all of these experiments. The difference is, is that 20 days before uh, a warming, uh, you perturb the stratosphere to wind a little bit. And essentially what you see here are, are time series of the wind evolution at 60, 60 north at 10 hectopascals. And uh, this is for essentially, they took the model and, and did a free run, found some warmings. You pick a, a, a single warming and then you run ensemble to that, of that warming where the troposphere is nudged. The red lines show ensembles that uh, with a perturbed stratosphere where you got a warming and the blue lines show uh, where the perturbation in the stratosphere to the basic state meant that you didn't get a warming. And essentially when you look at the, the wave injection, so this is the, uh, the wave flux between 45, 75 north, that was the, the set of latitudes um, on a wave flux coming up. And what you see here is, is for uh, the red lines where you, you had, had a, a warming versus the blue lines where you did not, uh, and this is up at 100 hectopascals, are, let's see, no, that's 10 hectopascals, 100 hectopascals, and 300 hectopascals. Essentially what you're seeing here is, is that uh, despite the fact that what's coming in from the troposphere at 300 hectopascals is identical, all you gotta do is bump the stratosphere and you can get a very different uh, set of occurrences. And that, that tells you something about the fact that there's not, the nonlinear dynamics in the stratosphere and the basic state are important. It's not, uh, it's not necessarily the, the injection from below. Another way to look at this is to look at the coherence. So essentially, this is, these are plots of, of height and, and frequency. And essentially, uh, what Alvaro did was he said, well, let's pick two, two levels and let's look at the coherence of wave activity with that level with all other levels. And the top panel, are, the left panels are the 300 hectopascals. Uh, and the right panel is 100 hectopascals. And therefore, whoops, did I? Oh, these are for the two different types of warmings. Uh, and essentially what you see here is that the coherence at 300 hectopascals, right, so that's in the lower uh, upward troposphere, lower stratosphere, depending on your latitude. The coherence of wave activity uh, is rather weak with the stratosphere. It's not coherent with what's, what's going on above. Uh, it's more coherent with what's going on below. If you pick 100 hectopascals, there is little coherence below uh, with wave activity uh, in, at, at 100 hectopascals with what's going on in the troposphere, and there's a huge amount of coherence with what's going on in the stratosphere. Okay, so what is, what is that telling you? So uh, if you recall in that Polvani and Waugh paper, uh, they said they correlated 100 hectopascals with the wind in the stratosphere. What this is telling you is that that's essentially correlating the event to itself. They're taking 100 hectopascals and saying the wave activity that's coming up is strongly correlated with the, the wobbling of the vortex. What we're saying here is that that level um, is internal to the event itself. So whatever nonlinear dynamic is going on in the stratosphere that's generating one of these events, if you pick 100 hectopascals, it is the event. Uh, so you have, if you wanted to say something about what's coming in from the lower stratosphere, you need to pick a level uh, that's lower, something like 300 uh, hectopascals, at which point you don't get any coherence with what's going on above because uh, it's not, it's dependent on the, on the stratospheric nonlinear um, interaction. So just to summarize, uh, sudden warmings are not typic uh, typically associated with anomalous tropospheric fluxes. Uh, the stratospheric basic state strongly matters. Um, sudden warmings have vertical wave flux signatures of uh, some sort of uh, resonance or vortex interaction dynamic. Um, the 300 to 100 hectopascal region seems to be kind of a crucial layer for determining whether uh, one of these events happens or not, not so much what's going on in the troposphere. And the current deterministic predictability limit is somewhere in the seven to 10, ten day range. Now it's a little bit longer mm -hmm. than in the troposphere, right, in the troposphere, I don't, you know, you, 10 days is probably asking a whole lot out of a forecast system model. Uh, but, but because of radiative damping time scales, things like that, the stratosphere, that, that gets stretched out a little bit to about 10 days. So in terms of seasonal predictability, that's, that's interesting because if you have 10 days of predictability on predicting one of these events and then once an event happens and you've got 60 days 
of uh, anomalous weather in the troposphere, it gives you something uh, into the future that you can use. So with that, I can take any questions. <laughs>